forecast, showers and thunderstorms today with strong southwesterly winds to 37 miles per hour. It's a numbers game, especially for the situation that we're in. We're coming off of a high water event here. The outdoors is not a hobby. It's not our passion. It is our way of life. We make the perfect cast, slow our breathing to execute a perfect shot, spend hours researching locations and techniques. Regardless of effort, we fail. This series is not about incredible bites or trophy animals. Our goal here at Day One Outdoors is to educate our viewers, utilizing new technology to offer a different perspective. Watch as we research new areas, plan out the day, and adjust to changing conditions. If not for other experienced outdoorsmen teaching me along the way, I wouldn't have this life. I owe it to them to pass this knowledge along. I owe it to you. Join us here on Day One Outdoors, and let's learn how to become more successful in the field and on the water from day one. Salmon are at the foundation of our genesis on the west coast. They carry a unique importance to our local culture. Little did we know, over 6,000 miles away, this same fish could become essential to anglers from another civilization. Puerto Monchile. We travel from 45 degrees north to 45 degrees south in an effort to find a salmon whose origin began on the Columbia River. For the past several years, rumors of 60, 80 pound Chinook circulated. But seeing is believing. We booked our flights and began our trek to South America. As we neared our destination, I turned my focus to the rivers below. Steep, craggy mountains created massive lakes that the rivers seemed to be born from. Braided rivers with drastic gradient changes from bedrock to sand and silt in a matter of just a few short river miles. After arriving in Puerto Montt, we took a short drive to Yankee Way Lodge, enjoying the beauty of what Chile has to offer. Although we were 6,000 miles away, it felt like home. We have pursued these salmon back home for decades. Although we had intimate knowledge of these fish from our home rivers, I was curious as to how they arrived this far south. Well, there's a couple different stories about how they got here, but the one that makes the most sense to me is that they brought them from the Columbia River system, from the uh, Kalama and the Caldas Rivers down and put them in net pens to, to raise them commercially. They had a tsunami, washed out their net pens and the fish got loose and, and uh, nobody's bothered them. That's one story. There's a concept called fish ranching and uh, some people set out in the early 80s to uh, plant fish in rivers, or plant eggs in rivers, uh, let the eggs hatch out and, and the young fish grow up in that river and then go to sea and, and they would come back and catch them. And as Clancy said, uh, they've documented that they took these, those particular fish from the Kalama and the Cowlitz, the eggs for them. And there may have been others that did from different rivers, but they planted those in rivers up north. And it could be that the water temperatures up north are a little warmer than they are here because none of those fish ever went back to those rivers. But they did start exploring rivers down here where we are. The research says the salmons always go back to the place where they born. Right. Yeah, and they release millions of salmons in rivers there, but they, they, they were waiting or the, the fish to clean back the rivers, and they, they spread out. They spread out <laughs> everywhere, everywhere. Vamos a ir sondeando la profundidad como que ellos no saben nada, ¿cachai? Yeah. Y van grabando todo eso. Don't laugh too hard, Ronaldo. It's our first morning out here, and 
southern Chile, just outside of Puerto Montt, and we're, we're chasing after Chinook salmon. And you know, honestly, Chuck, the, the fishing brain's going 100 miles an hour because I'm trying to think of exactly where these fish are going to be. And if I use the knowledge that we have from fishing Oregon, like let's say again, these are fall Chinook here in March. So we use the fisheries that we have with buoy 10 and Astoria, and then a little bit further south down to Tillamook Bay, which this reminds me a lot of up here. It's a big tide change today. It's about 16, 18 feet. And anytime you get a big tide change like that, a lot of water moving, we want to find off channel areas. And looking at the fjord out here, it's a choke point. It's a narrow area. So there's gonna be a lot of flow coming out. The Petroway River that flows in where the fish are trying to return to to go spawn is just up here. And those fish right now, looking at the research that we did, looking at uh, satellite images, there's a huge alluvial fan, lots of sand coming out of there. So it's outgoing tide, the fish won't be up there. So it's a complete guessing game right now. We're gonna throw everything we have at them. I'm already second guessing the gear that we had tied on last night, but it's just gonna take time. And that's something that we don't have a lot of because we're just down here for a couple days, but. It's a salmon, so we should be able to catch them. Yeah, yeah, it's the same exact fish for us. You know, these fish were planted down here in the 70s and 80s, and they've now expanded to over 400 miles of coastline where they come back. And this is supposedly a phenomenal fishery. We're gonna find out. Yeah, we'll, we'll be the judges. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're gonna let the fish be a judge, put the, or the scale, let the scale be yeah, a judge. Right, yeah. Oh, wow. That was a 30 pounder just broke surface right You're there. Kidding. Dude, just right there. It's only about 25 to 35 feet of water. So that's good. What is creating off this point is a big current eddy. Now these fish are what's called optometric. They're gonna try and follow some sort of structure, be it a current break like what we have here, a temperature break, any type of structure that they can associate to. What also happens on these current breaks like this is we get a lot of bait, which is what I'm looking at right now. So what I think what we might do is just kind of come back here, find that soft edge and just kind of graft through there. Now we marked a lot back there in the bay kind of near where we put the boats in the water near the island, but we're here to explore this first part of the morning. So we're gonna kind of cut through here, take a look at it, see what we find. But I'm also seeing a lot of grass too, which makes it tough to fish. We're running 10 ounces on these. We'll work the bottom with these two. And that one will put like six on it and just let it fish in the middle of the water column. Chuck, right about 40 feet on the counter. You're already getting grassed up. <laughs> okay, what am I doing? We are battling with gear and grass right now. Every time we get it down, we come across another pile of grass, which is just indicative of what happens during a big, strong, outgoing tide like this. But we're marking a lot of bait. We even just saw a salmon pushing a bait ball back there. So we know we're in the right area. We just need to figure out a way to troll through all this and manage our gear a little bit better. Yeah, we're, we're getting grassed up way too much here. It's dragging my lines all over the place. This is almost impossible to fish right here. Even though we're marking fish in this area, the current is just dragging our gear around too much with all this grass. So we're gonna pick up our stuff head back to where we were on the other side of this point, get out of this current where all the grass is stacking up and be able to fish in that punch bowl where their fish are coming off those flats. I think it has a lot to do with just exactly the, the nature of the Chinook salmon. Uh, the things that the salmon need probably more than anything is nutrients in the upper watershed. And what happens is, is these rivers down here and the rivers up in the north, they're really so clean, they have very few nutrients in them. So Mother Nature designed the Chinook salmon or the Pacific salmon to go out into the ocean, spend two, three years in the, in the ocean, and then come back into the rivers and spawn and die one time. There's no other fish in the world that does this. It gets up to 30, 40 pounds and dies. Well, the body disintegrates in just about a month or two months so that the, when the babies come out of the gravel, that this is what they have because the rivers are so poor in nutrients that they have to have something to sustain themselves and to get a high egg to smolt ratio. And what that means is if 100, 100 eggs go in the gravel, how many of them actually head to the ocean? With the pure water that we have, if there was no other nutrients in the river, you'd only get about a 2% egg to smolt ratio, which isn't enough to build it up very rapidly. So over 65 years of these salmon being here, spawning and dying and developing a higher nutrients in the upper watershed 
then all of a sudden that population starts shooting up. And that's what I think we, we see today here. Fishfield is your one-stop shop online for the gear you need here in the Pacific Northwest and beyond. From salmon and steelhead, saltwater, trout and kokanee, even crabbing. Visit fishfield.com today to place an order with no sales tax and have the gear you need shipped fast. Fishfield.com, we have what the Northwest Outdoorsman needs. Every once in a while, a new lure comes along that catches every angler's attention. It could be because of all the irresistible colors and finishes, or the patented skip beat action, or maybe it's the wide variety of sizes designed for salmon, trout, walleye, steelhead, mackinac, and more. But just for the record, we know one thing for certain. We didn't design the maglip to catch fishermen. Yakima Bait Company. Salmon swim up to 3,000 miles to return to their exact place of birth to reproduce. Well, most of the time. We're going to do a quick run through on our gear and what we brought down here is the exact same stuff that we use in the Pacific Northwest and we brought it all the way down here to Chile. What I brought down are the XCC 965 Canine Quick Rods. You can use anything from an eight and a half to 10 and a half foot long rod. But the reason why I brought this nine foot six five power rod down here is because it's so versatile. It has a really strong backbone down here, which should be able to handle these 40, 50 pound Chinook that we hope to find. And still has a nice parabolic bend on the front end to allow the fish to grab the lure, turn, and drive the hook in the corner of its mouth. As far as our reel goes, line counter reels are a must. We're fishing a lot of different parts of the water column from 10 feet of water all the way down to 80, even 100 feet. So being able to manage your depth and then dialing in exactly where you're getting your bite is really important. Our line, we're running 30 pound maximum monofilament line here. I really like the monofilament just because it has a lot of forgiveness, which especially on these big fish is important when the fish are right next to the boat. If we're running braided line, there's no stretch. So an inch of movement at the fish is an inch of movement at the rod tip and we could end up pulling the hooks free or breaking the line. So I really do like running monofilament line for these bigger fish. So from this 30 pound maximum high vis, we come down to our gear, our terminal tackle, and again is the exact same setups that we're running back home. We're running a slider on our main line, right below a TB to grab onto any grass that we find, down to a snap swivel, and here's our 200 pound monofilament bumper down to our flasher. And the reason why we run 200 pound is not because we need 200 pound on these fish, it's because it's stiff. And that allows us to keep our flasher from tangling up in our main line or in our leaders. So it just helps our setup stay clean and fish straight as best we can. Down to our flasher right here, we're running the eight inch YBC fish flash, the Big Al's fish flash here. It's a good medium size, doesn't grab too much water, but still gets plenty of flash down there. From here, we're running anywhere from four to six foot a liter, 50 pound fluorocarbon. We're running 50 pound because these fish are getting close to their spawning grounds. It's March, but it's fall time, so the fish are coming up to spawn, and these bucks will get really big teeth, and when they come and bite our lure, they could take it deep enough where their teeth are gonna be rubbing against the line, so I definitely like to run 50 pound. Down to our lures, I'm running the size five FST spoons. These lures will cover a lot of water, create a lot of action down there, and get the fish's attention, so we're trolling a few of these. In addition to the size five FSTs, we're running anywhere from a size five to a size seven spinner. We're covering as many different options as we possibly can to try and figure these fish out. As far as colors go, we're still guessing, but what I'm doing right now is we're actually using a lot of blues out there right now, a lot of silvers, and looking at the water temperature and where we are with how close we are, 
to the river that flows in, I think I'm gonna start switching that up to more of your reds, your whites, and your greens. Typically what we use when the fish get up a little bit closer to fresh water. And then as far as scent goes, man, we're trying everything. Uh, the one thing I didn't bring down here is krill, and it sounds like that's what a lot of their diet is. So we're using anywhere from uh, the sardine super gel to some fish oils and some of the skirts that we have, and that really will absorb it well, so that should help us out a lot. And then uh, any type of anise or garlic, we're throwing the kitchen sink at them. We're trying it all and letting them decide what's gonna work here. We started doing this just the last, last year, but uh, we find the, 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 the fish start getting color here, right here. Yeah, so that's Sorry, happened turning also. color. We have a strain, it sounds like the strain of fish that you got here mm -hmm. uh, were two types. You got a, the lower Columbia River fish, which stays bright, yeah. and then you got the tule fish. And the tule fish are the ones that have the really big backs, big adipose fin, uh -huh. and those ones, they'll turn dark in the ocean. The second they smell fresh water, they start turning that goldish brown. Uh, yeah, and they, they, they have to go long way up to the Columbia? I mean, how No, many? they usually spawn in lower river, ah, like lower. in the yeah. first 60, 80 miles. Okay, okay. And so they're, they usually stay really low in the system. Is there a certain part of the tide that they bite well? Because back home, it's an hour on either side of the tide change. I'm assuming with the big tide swings that you have here, it's going to be pretty similar. Uh, you know what, so the thing we, we find here is uh, the behavior is uh, almost same as the river. So okay. it, no matter the tide, they used to buy early in the morning. So really? it okay. almost stop at, at noon. Really? So, yeah, and we try later in the afternoon and once a while we catch some. So, but peleando con uno. It's like another one of those feeders. Which one's on? Is that that? That's a spoon. It's nice and slow on up. <laughs> I hope it's like that big, dude. What is that? This is a merluza. It's a salt, saltwater fish. It's called merluza. That's the first. I've never caught one of those. <laughs> <laughs> Look at the big eyes. Oh, well, they're crazy looking. Crazy looking. <laughs> Chuck, you want to get a picture with it? Yeah, yeah, I do. Good thing I brought a camera guy. Uh, it's called the. It's called the merluza. It's very, very, very popular. So we, the commercial fishermen, ca catch a lot of these and send to Europe with good dates. But this is was a small one. They used to be uh, eight pounds. This is the, the 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 size to good ones. Yeah. Yeah. Come on, man. There's just we're on them. We're marking a lot of salmon right now, a lot. And what's frustrating about that is that we are right near the bottom of the tide, so we should be getting ripped, but it's not happening. So when we're putting our pattern together, we look for those three things. Number one being location, we're in the right location. We know where the fish are, they're in this deeper water. We got our gear fishing right on their nose. So not only are we in the right spot in the fjord here, but we're also in the right part of the water column. So that means that we go on to number two, which is our presentation. Are we going too fast, too slow? Do they not like the action of the spinners or the spoons kicking around? Which is it? Is there a presentation that's screwing up or maybe it's just our color or our scent? So that's number three. Once we figure out one and two, our location and our presentation, number three is dialing in our color and our scent. So we've switched up colors once, changed a couple scents around. We still haven't been able to get these fish to go quite yet. Uh, we're just gonna keep on playing the guessing game here, but we found them. Now we just got to dial it in here and we got a little bit of time. According to Reynaldo, the fish stopped biting usually about noon. So we're, we only got about two hours left here for the locals say the bite stopped. So we got to figure it out quick. There's some fish at 50. fish are definitely here and hopefully on the switch we tend to get a nice little snap. Again it's getting later in the day and according to our guide he said that the fish typically bite first thing in the morning regardless of the tide and then bite dies. So this might be our best chance this morning here on our test day to try and figure these fish out because come tomorrow when we fish a long day, whew, 
we got a long ways to go because we we haven't even had a bite yet. So hopefully we can figure something out with these fish. Just dumped it down into all that bait and just almost right away. Another one of those. <laughs> yeah, same, yep. I'm a Lusa. We're catching the fish that they never catch. <laughs> we ask them. You guys ever catch these? No, never. We are. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> we can't First catch a salmon, ever, but. <laughs> I was just seeing my gear rip the bottom and it's tap bottom here again and I came up two quick cranks and right as I did it folded over. Don't know if it was just one of those other fish we were catching or if that was actually a salmon but it's excitement. <laughs> Something's happening. Yeah, you can drop yours back down Chuck. Our second morning right now and we're getting our gear set up and back out in the water we learned a lot yesterday and what we learned is that for the most part the fish did not want the spinners they wanted the spoons we found that out by looking at our underwater footage and the one bite that we thought we had yesterday was actually just the fish come up and looking at the flasher and the camera then turning away and get the hook back in his tail so we're changing everything up we went to all spoons and all three rods three different colors three different depths three different scents and even three different leader lengths here. Went from shorter, like this one here, it's only about three feet, down to leader lengths at about six foot. So we're trying it all. On top of that, we're gonna utilize local knowledge. We have Christian, our guide here today, who's gonna be covering all the gear that we need, but not only that, he's gonna put us on the spot where he feels confident that we're gonna catch fish. Christian has brought his own Lawrence unit out here to make sure that we are exactly on the spot where he has the most confidence. So hopefully today, we can finally catch one of these Chinook that came from our own backyard all the way down here in Chile. So I'm going to get this guy down here now. So in a few months, I'll be catching these exact same fish. In the same way. 6,000 miles away. But this one <laughs> speaks Spanish. So <laughs> yeah. And what I liked about this yesterday was this is all 30 to 40 like foot. corners. Yeah. Corners. Like that one. Like that one. Corners. Concentrates the fish. Yep. That's the lure going thump, thump, thump. <laughs> they exist, gentlemen. They exist. Been out here fishing all day long. Haven't had a bite yet. And our camera boat just hooked up right over here. He got it right next to the boat. So we're going to come over and help him out. Might even jump on his boat and help him net it. So we'll see how it goes. Here he is right here. Here next to you. I just stepped to your right. You want him? Yeah. Nope. Huh? Like this, right? <laughs> Not done yet. All the way to the swivel. If you can reel all the way to the swivel. Oh, it's real nice and slow up. Nope, he's gonna go. <laughs> Okay, we got him here. All the way to swivel. Oh, watch the side of the boat. Rod tip down, rod tip down, rod tip down. There you go. Okay, there we go. 
God, I feel like I'm guiding again. <laughs> okay, he's gonna go underneath the boat's rod, tip down. There you go. Lift. Lift straight up. Oh, he doesn't want to quit. Pretty good. Easy, buddy. You got it? Got it, yep. You got him? Yeah. <laughs> 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 Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. Maybe. Big man. Yeah, big buck, yep. Yeah. You see these fish, they look exactly like our lower Columbia River fish. The big back, big adipose. It looks just like a clam or a callet's fish. Same spots on them. Beautiful. Yeah, it is. Not very long, but just thick, tall. Thick. Man. Yeah, they're just dark, thick, really wide. Looking good. All right. Ready to let them go? Yeah. There he goes. There he goes, man. <laughs> That's awesome, man. Yeah, finally. <laughs> Nicely done. Hey, might not have been on our boat, but we saw our first Chilean salmon. That's awesome. <laughs> Good job, Fernando. Thank you, man. Well, you're well done. It's like we're filming. He's a good one. Pretty good. Yeah, you should have seen this sucker jumping, though. I've never seen a big king go like that. I don't always see the Chinook come up on the surface like that and flip and fight around like this. And that was what was unusual about this fish. It's a little dark. In that color, you should probably be up in the river. So we just had two fish get caught in the other two boats. We're still blanked. And it's, it's going to be just a little frustrating. I'm having a hard time thinking that these fish, the same fish from our river, aren't biting the gear that we have. So I'm just going to keep on mixing it up. We're at low slack right now. Something's got to pop here. I'm going to figure it out. <laughs> <laughs>